where in my career future. But hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you guys had a good break. If anybody collects dead batteries, there were two in the microphone, but they're up there. No? No dead battery collections? Sorry. Buff, welcome back to EMP, it's November 29th. That is today, at least for the next, what, six hours and 53 minutes? So if you go to the fall 2018 announcements, ES199, EMP, what do you want to see November 29th? You should find a link that will take you to some slides that look like this. And if there are no questions before we begin, go ahead and get started. Okie doke. So, ooh, look, another survey. So, a couple of you have been really concerned that it doesn't seem like there's much that you have to be doing in order to get credit for this class. It's mostly because I don't particularly want to fail anybody trying to take a one hour pass fail credit course. But if it makes you feel better, I made another survey. So, if you want to go ahead and take it, or if you do, didn't manage to take the first one, here's a makeup survey just so uh, your email gets recorded. So, I'll just take the net ID and check you off. But if you've already taken it, or taken the first one, you're free to take it anyway. And I've made five of the seven questions mandatory, and you'll see why. I enjoy just, you'll see why. But questions on survey. What is Bogo's sort? <laughs> is the best sort ever. So <laughs> it's the one where you have uh, an array of elements yeah, you essentially shuffle them all up randomly, check to see if it's sorted. If it is, great, you're done. If not, you go and shuffle it again, check to see if it's sorted. If it is, great. If not, you go again, and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. So it's the best sort ever. <laughs> Any other questions? There's also like Bogo Bogo sort and a bunch of other fun sorts, but Bogo's the OG. Oh, cool. All right, so your weekly links for giving feedback uh, just for EMP. So we have an anonymous feedback form and a topic suggestion form. So again, these are 100% optional. You don't ever have to once fill it out, but if you do have feedback that you would like to give, I would love to um, hear your guys' thoughts. And if you have topics that you want to go over next week, you can find it there. I enjoy hearing your suggestions. Cool there? All right. So I know it's been a little while, but what did we do last time? So a lot of web stuff. So web, web APIs, web slinging, web shooting, web designers. And then exceptions. So that was yesterday. And I'm super excited because my favorite superhero is Spider Man. Yeah. Definitely Team Marvel. But questions there? Sound reasonable? All right. Jump right into it then. So the internet, so simple. And I'm told the cool Reddit kids use this slash S for sarcasm because the internet is not simple. <laughs> it's a global system of interconnected computer networks, at least according to Wikipedia, and I like their definition. So we have some wires, some glass, or what the fiber's made out of, and then the copper, and then we have different layers of what's going on and protocols, and it all comes together to create the internet. So we can see like application layer, the HTTP, and HTTPS, which you should probably be using HTTPS by now, but those will be at the application layer. And as we work our way down, we can see IP at the network. And if some of this stuff seemed really interesting to you, then definitely, like, if you're 
CS major, I think you have to take computer networks, but consider taking a computer networks class or like go learn about it on your own because it's really fun stuff. And then Wi-Fi above food, water, shelter, warmth. Questions there? One slide on the internet. Cool. So how do we actually get the World Wide Web? Well, first of all, we need a protocol. So we have the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, uh, HTTP, or HTTP Secure. That's getting really hard to say, but that's HTTPS. So chances are you know that you're on a good website. If they have HTTPS, there is rarely ever a reason now where they should just be doing HTTP. But I digress. And then a markup language. So this is going to be how everything is going to be displayed. So this is use the hypertext markup language or HTML. Um, we have a styling language, so how we can make all our websites look pretty. So that's the cascading style sheets or CSS is more commonly seen. And then back to programming, because we're programmers. So we have JavaScript or JS, which there are a lot of memes out there on how Java and JavaScript are not related at all, so I encourage you to Google those later. Questions there? Cool. And then note, HTML is a markup language, not a programming language, so now you get to be the one who corrects your friends whenever they're saying that HTML is my favorite programming language, because it's markup not programming. The office, yes. So things break down to just a number of, um, well, we'll start out with get requests. So get requests are requesting data from a server. So a lot of the times whenever you're trying to get information because the internet is where you're exchanging a lot of information, so to get it, we can use query parameters and key value pairs to request data from the server. So it, you'll see in URLs, whenever you're searching something, it'll start out with a question mark and then one to many key equals values. So depending on what you're searching and how strict of criteria that you want is going to be how many key values. And those are going to be separated by the ampersands. And just for a live demo. So if we go to just csillinois.edu and want to search something, so CS125, then we can see up in the address bar, we have my GCS equals CS125, Google Computer Science. I don't know what GCS stands for, but that's what we searched. And we can actually manipulate this if we want without having to go. So this is 199. So if we wanted to change our search, we could actually do it from the URL and see results for 199. Questions there? Learning how to manipulate URLs are fun because most websites they anticipate people just to be using the buns and stuff so you can uncover bugs and other things and then email the developers. It's fun. And correct people. I've done that a couple times. I thought I was going to get free stuff if I pointed out what was wrong with this retail shop's website. They were just like, OK, cool, thanks. Like, You're welcome. Give me free things. I saved you. That's fine. I'm not better. Questions there? Go on, get. So when things go wrong, we get a 404. So this is probably what you've seen before. So this means that the server couldn't find what was requested. So I saw a funny joke the other day. So I did an IQ test recently, and I think I got a better score than what has ever been found. I got a 404 because the IQ tests online, the results page, could not be found. Programmer dad humor, it's good. Cool there? 
So some of the other um, HTTP status codes that you might see, you'll see 200 OK a lot. That just means that everything was a success. 403 is forbidden, so the request was actually valid, but the server refused for whatever reason. Oftentimes, these are permission issues. And then 404 is the actual not found, so the server couldn't find whatever was requested. 418, I'm a teapot. So that started out as 1998's April Fool's Day prank, so it specifies that it should be returned by teapots requested to brew coffee, and it's a real thing, which I think is hilarious. And it's also an Easter egg, I think, in, I think if you do something with Google, I think. And then 500 internal server errors, so that means something has gone completely wrong. So 400 is typically on the user's end, and then 500 is like something went completely wrong with the server. And then a little link for the full list of HTTP status codes, but any questions there? Fun stuff? All right, so we can get information from the internet, but we also wanna be able to post stuff and contribute our information and contribute our wonderful thoughts or filling out surveys, buying stuff online, or generating rapper names, or probably not, because if you were posting the, your credit card information and your social security, and then last thing you ate, you probably should not be doing that on the internet. Just a pro tip. Cool, I'm post. So some of the differences between get and post, because it can get kind of confusing. So here's just a little list that I got from W3 school. So um, typically, whenever you're doing get, if you push the back button or refresh the page, it's harmless. But with post, you've probably seen it before on just, are you sure you want to repeat this? Um, data will be resubmitted. Uh, warnings like that. Luckily, the browser um, typically lets you know whenever you're attempting to um, resubmit stuff again. And then as we, as I showed real quick before, um, you can actually um, manipulate in the URL for um, get requests, but you can't do that for post. It's, um, so it's not actually, um, inside the URL, it's through the website, and so data is not displayed in the URL, which is a good thing, because some of the things that you need to post, like your credit card information, you don't want that in the URL. Cool, and differences between get and post? So a lot of this, um, I think W3Schools is really amazing. Um, it, definitely helped me a lot whenever I was first trying to learn how to make uh, web pages and all of that. It's kind of a lifesaver. Um, actually getting the certificates from them don't recommend. It's kind of useless, but going through the tutorials is great. And then whenever you're making stuff yourself, um, there are lots of free HTML templates, CSS templates out there. It's just a Google search away. Uh, the only thing that you would want to be careful of is making sure that you follow licensing agreements. Just a little disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, but if you're using templates that are meant to be um, just open source and you're using it like for commercial use or something like that, you could be violating a license agreement, so be careful out there. Questions? So APIs, they are a set of functions that perform a set of related and useful tasks. So one of the things that I notice a lot with computer science is there seem to be 
Um, so many names for so many similar sounding things and different names for the same thing but in different situations and just gets confusing. But that's job security for us, so we get to keep teaching you guys. And whenever you guys get too comfortable starting to learn our tricks, we'll just introduce a new word. But if you want to learn the differences between API, library, framework, etc., I found this Stack Overflow question clarifies things at least well enough where I could be like, okay, those are different words. Cool and APIs? So web APIs, an API that you access over the web. Much, wow, pretty self-explanatory. So you send the request, so you pop in the URL, you make it a query parameter, whatever example they use in the documentation. So I believe this is the documentation from lecture, so you can actually see what's going on in some of these. So documentation is your friend, especially if it's good documentation. And then you get a response back, and this is the JavaScript. Um, Object notation. So JSONs are quite common and they are quite useful. So to show you a little example of this in action. So you were, there's a link of all these APIs. I actually use the random pictures of cats. So basically what's going on here is here in the, whenever you go to random cats slash meow, you just get this little thing that has file and the string for a JPEG. But if I wanna use it for my website, so forcing pictures to look at my cat, you're like, I'm sick of looking at your cat. Like here, not my cat. Probably need to refresh. Sad face. This is why whenever you do live demos, everything goes wrong. Oh, uh, I don't think their website's responding. I was having trouble with it before. We could try again later. Cats are cool. It's randomly gonna catch up. So we'll try it again in a second. But basically what happens, and you can kind of throw stuff easily together, is that um, you make a new XML HTTP request, and then I request a get from the website. I forget what the true parameter stands for. And then on load, so you can go ahead and parse the JSON, which was this JSON over here. And then if this request status, so that's the HTTP status is within the range where it's like, okay, nothing went wrong. Then I have an index HTML here with an ID of image where it's displaying the image. And then we can set the source. So you set source to wherever you want it to point. I want it to, I want it to set it to the JSON at whatever the file key was. I want it to that value. See, it wasn't me, it was random cat. Haha, <laughs> still not good, but. There's still a lesson here, by the way. Don't completely rely on APIs that you don't have full control over, especially if you're doing live demos for your EMP class. But that actually did happen uh, whenever I was doing my senior design project. Uh, we were also using a web API and the developers had changed a bunch of stuff, so we had to change our code in order to match whatever the developers had updated. So it's the joy and struggles of web APIs. Rip. So moving on with APIs, we have RESTful APIs. So that's a representational state transfer. So uniform and predefined set of stateless operations. Thank you, Wikipedia. 
So uniform comes from, we want URLs to map to resources, and we want it in a uniform fashion, naturally. Um, predefined means that the verbs and co uh, codes all have meaning. So we're not having to write our own definitions. There's a set of um, verbs and codes that we already understand what they represent. And then stateless, so bodies of requests and responses are in JSON. So all the inform information that we need is contained in the JSON. So whoever's sending the JSON and whoever is receiving the JSON, they don't care about either one. So whenever I send the request, I don't care how the information that I am wanting gets back to me. All I care about is that I get it. And similarly with the sender, they don't care why I need the information or in what context or anything else. They're just going to get it for me and send it back. Cool there? So the end-to-end -end principle, so the end nodes, which means that the two devices that are communicating, so this is at the application level typically, so they have the power and responsibility for their application-specific features. So the features actually reside in the nodes. So we don't have things where um, we have to communicate at lower levels or put other ports or um, other things responsible for what's going on. It should just feel like even though there's an infrastructure going on underneath, we shouldn't care about what's going on there as long as the two end nodes um, can communicate. And then net neutrality, so I am not a lawyer, philosopher, nor a politician. Um, here's the Wikipedia page for it. I'm glad that it all got settled, but it's your responsibility or future responsibility to make sure that we do good things. Leave it at that. Questions there? I think that's fine. Right. So exceptions and errors. So exceptions, because your program crashing isn't always the answer um, to when something goes wrong. Only sometimes. We have a couple different types of exceptions. So there are checked exceptions. Um, if you can anticipate something might go wrong and it's out of your control, um, so assuming that the user is going to do the worst possible things with your code, that's typically where you're going to want some try-catch handling. So if you're trying to load an image that doesn't actually exist, we'll have to surround that on a try-catch. And then unchecked exceptions, also known as runtime errors. So they're usually caused by something done that is the programmer's fault, so going off the edge of the array. I don't know if you guys have ever made a mistake with your code, but I've made plenty, so I know that programmers do dumb things. But then we have errors where we have completely goofed up. So this is kind of reserved for the serious system problems that are probably beyond recoverable. So for instance, Java out of memory. And again, like a lot of these can like come back to, okay, this was probably our fault if we were just declaring a bunch of things that we didn't actually need. But luckily, the programs that we're writing, you shouldn't have to encounter that. Questions on types of errors? So some of the vocabulary, I think the vocab's kind of fun, so that's why I love Java exceptions. So the try-catch block, so this is Java's exception handling control structure. So try is try something risky, and catch should be bolded, but that's fine. So catch, catch the exception, and within there, how do we want to react to it? A lot of times we might just ignore it or print a stack trace, but sometimes we actually want to do stuff with the exceptions. And then exception E, so typically we'll name exceptions E, so that's why that's there. But that's the little exception that we want to throw and catch, like a baseball that we can break open and get a little message that something went wrong. 
And then why I love C++, C++'s exception and ease method is e dot what. So that's where I would argue that C++ is better than Java is the what message. And then throws. So whenever we're about to throw an exception, we stop what we're doing, we give up, we're like, something happened, I don't want to do the rest of this. And then we hurl the baseball message that we've given up and why we're given up. So that would be what sort of exception happened. Pull in vocab. So things that we're going to have to do. So if we're using a method that throws an exception, even if we know that I have never made a mistake in my entire life, we'll, we're never going to cause an exception, um, being a good programmer means trusting no one. So we have to surround those in a try-catch or continue the throwing by adding throws to the method declaration that we're actually using the other method that threw the, ex the original exception. So for example, loading an image using Java's buffered image. So this is actually a IRL example. So I was creating a program for my friend who wanted me to remove all the parentheses and all the contents inside the parentheses from PDFs, which was really fun. So I decided to make a fun little background image. So I'm going to try to make this buffered image. And then if something goes wrong, we'll catch the exception and just print out E. But I knew that I was just creating an executable for him. So as soon as the executable was created, then I had nothing to worry about. So I didn't do much with the exception there. Yeah, so that would be the stack trace. So actually, here, let's just screw this up by taking this out so it's no longer a valid path. So right now it just prints what e dot is, and then I think it's. Is there an actual print? Yeah, print stack trace. That's the one that we want. And then we don't want that. Oh, right. <laughs> Not a statement. I don't know why I had an issue with the parentheses. That's interesting. So we have those stack trace over here, and then all oh, this is where it happened. And then the part that we'll actually want to be concerned about is probably right here, because this is where we're creating and displaying the GUI or graphic uh, user interface. So line 137. So I had an issue when we were actually trying to create it up here. So this is where we were getting the exception from before. And then it was being called by main. But sometimes we want the show to go on. So you can see that it still popped up with a friend's name is Cody, so it was his parent remover. Um, but the image would typically be right here. But sometimes we'll want the show to go on. So for instance, is like this, if the image doesn't load, but we saw the functionality there, then it's probably all right. Sometimes it seems that this method is, takes a lot of progress. I mean, it means uh, it takes on a lot of Yeah, it's not the most efficient way to go about doing things, but if you don't really care about it, like if at the end you're just like um, delivering an executable or something, then um, it really doesn't matter. But in some cases, like you need it to 
uh, load immediately, then you might want to consider alternatives. Any other questions? Go ahead and fix that. Questions on that side? So some things that we can do, so we can have multiple catches. Sometimes things are not our fault, so users do dumb things, like enter in a bad file path. Uh, sometimes things are our fault, so developers, again, do dumb things. So, um, for example, didn't take into account a type of valid formatting for a file. So it can be useful to differentiate between the two. And again, going back to real life example. So up here is the code to actually convert the PDF and remove all the parentheses and everything else. And then there's a lot of things that could go wrong. So this is nested in one big try. But so we're going to try to load the document, get all the text from it, remove all the parentheses, and then save it as a new document. But let's say the user input a bad file. We'll want to catch the file not found exception. So look into the message and see if it was the bad file or bad output path, and then ask the user to try again. But for all other exceptions, it was probably my fault, so I was going to tell my friend to go yell at me if something like that happened. So it's useful to differentiate if it's probably the user's fault or it might have been my fault. So that's where we would want to do different exceptions and react differently to depending on which exception we caught. <coughs> Questions there? Cool. So I just have practice type stuff. So if you wanted to um, work on any of the practice problems that I have on my slides, if not, the rest of the time is yours to work on whatever, get individualized help. Um, any questions overall? No? Cool. <coughs> See if the, hey, it worked. Yay. See, web APIs, you could get random cats. This one with Dr. Pepper. Aw, that one's cute. <laughs> All right, I'm done. <laughs>